many women live with health conditions that can make daily life quite difficult. Two of the most common are uterine fibroids and endometriosis. These conditions can cause significant pain, heavy menstrual bleeding, a lot of discomfort. They can affect work, family, life, overall well-being. Because they are so common, it is incredibly useful to understand what they are and what might help. A truly surprising statistic suggests that up to 80% of all women may develop a fibroid by the time they reach the age of 40. This is a huge number, and it highlights just how important this topic is for so many people. So, let's start with fibroids. What are they? A uterine fibroid, also known as a layer myoma, is a benign growth that develops from the muscle tissue of the uterus. The word benign is very important here. It means that fibroids are not cancerous. They are dense lumps of muscle and fibrous tissue that grow within or on the uterine wall. These growths can vary dramatically in size. Some can be as tiny as a small seed, completely unnoticeable. Others can grow to be as large as a melon, causing the uterus to expand and press on nearby organs like the bladder or rectum. The symptoms of fibroids can vary a great deal from one woman to another. Some women have fibroids and experience no symptoms at all, only discovering them during a routine exam or an ultrasound. For others, fibroids can cause a whole host of problems. Very heavy and prolonged menstrual bleeding, which can sometimes lead to anemia, severe pelvic pain, pressure and fullness, urinary and bowel changes. Now let's turn our attention to endometriosis. While it can also cause pain and is linked to hormones, it is a fundamentally different condition from fibroids. Endometriosis occurs when tissue very similar to the lining of the uterus starts to grow outside of the uterus. This misplaced tissue is called an endometrial implant. These implants can appear on the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, the outer surface of the uterus and the tissues lining the pelvis. In rarer cases, this tissue can be found farther afield. The problem is that it behaves like uterine lining. Each month, as hormones fluctuate, the tissue thickens, breaks down and bleeds, but the blood has nowhere to go. This leads to inflammation and scar tissue called adhesions which can cause severe chronic pain. At the heart of both fibroids and endometriosis is a single powerful hormone, estrogen. Estrogen helps regulate the cycle and supports pregnancy, but in these conditions it acts like fuel for abnormal growth. A little is necessary, too much can make things grow out of control. Treatments often reduce estrogen levels or block its effects. For fibroids, the connection is direct. Fibroid cells have more estrogen receptors and react more strongly to the same hormone level. They often grow during pregnancy and shrink after menopause. They also contain more aromatase, converting androgens into estrogen and creating a local high estrogen environment. Inflammation and low oxygen inside a fibroid further stimulate growth. In endometriosis, estrogen drives implants to thicken and bleed, leading to pain and inflammation. So some therapies suppress ovulation and lower estrogen to let implants regress. Now, let's introduce a new player, vitamin D. We often think of it for bone health because it helps us absorb calcium and we get it from sunlight, food and supplements. But vitamin D is also a hormone with receptors in the uterus, the immune system and the brain. This discovery opened research into many conditions, including fibroids. Researchers noticed fibroid risks often overlap with low vitamin D. Overweight people tend to have lower levels because vitamin D gets sequestered in fat tissue. People with darker skin synthesize less from sunlight and also have higher fibroid risk. If vitamin D regulates cell growth and inflammation, deficiency may remove the body's natural breaks. This could help explain higher prevalence among black women, though genetics and lifestyle matter too. The key point. Vitamin D status is modifiable, a hopeful, practical lever. When we look at vitamin D for fibroids, we move from theory to evidence. In the lab, Adding vitamin D to fibroid cells slows their growth, putting the brakes on cell multiplication. It may inhibit aromatase, 
reduce inflammation, and even trigger apoptosis in abnormal cells. Of course, petri dishes aren't people. Still, some studies report significant fibroid shrinkage with supplementation over several weeks. In high-risk groups, supplementation has been linked to reduced fibroid size. These findings bridge lab mechanisms and real-world benefits, promising, though not definitive. Larger, longer trials will clarify who benefits most and how to dose safely. While some studies are promising, the overall picture is mixed. Many trials use low bone-oriented doses that may be too small for dense fibroid tissue. Fibroids are hard, poorly perfused and hypoxic, conditions where vitamin D may work less effectively, so modest doses might not reach targets adequately. Infrequent dosing creates peaks and troughs. Daily dosing can keep steadier levels. Short trials may not budge fibroids that took years to grow. Starting levels, body weight, genetics and diet all matter. Severely deficient people may benefit more than those already near normal. Look at studies that showed benefit, often higher doses, longer durations, and the right patients. When taking vitamin D, especially higher doses, cofactors matter. Magnesium and vitamin K2 are the key partners. Magnesium supports the liver and kidneys to activate vitamin D. If you are low in magnesium, you cannot use vitamin D effectively. Modern diets leave many people magnesium deficient. Vitamin K2 helps direct absorbed calcium into bones and teeth, not soft tissues. That reduces the risk of calcium ending up in arteries or kidneys. A D3 plus K2 supplement, alongside adequate magnesium, is a sensible, balanced approach. Always discuss supplements and dosing with your doctor. So, what are the practical, safe steps you can take if you have fibroids or endometriosis or are concerned about risk? First, see your doctor. Self-diagnosing is never a good idea. You'll need proper evaluation, exam and imaging to confirm what's going on. This is the foundation for any treatment plan. Next, discuss vitamin D and get a 25-hydroxyvitamin D blood test. Use results to tailor a safe plan, including magnesium and vitamin K2. Support hormones with healthy weight, diet and regular activity. Increase fibre and reduce inflammatory foods. With a comprehensive plan, you can feel more in control of your health.